You know, I actually own, I'm, I'm what you consider a landlord host. Okay. Meaning I own um, my short-term rentals, but I also execute a known strategy called rental arbitrage. Mm-hmm. Meaning I rent these properties. I'm yeah. not um, I'm not owning them. You yeah. don't have to own them. I rent them on a, on a corporate lease, a business lease, long-term business lease. And I re-rent the property out short-term. Right. Yo, you're listening to the Money Monopolizers Podcast. Helping you take control of your financial destiny. It's about time that we invest more in our financial literacy and work towards building generational wealth. If you think you're ready to do the same, then you've come to the right place. Alex, Marlon, y'all ready? Let's get this bread. What's good, everybody? It's Alex Kamunia here. We are back with episode 111 of the Money Monopolizers podcast, and I am here with my co-host, Marlon Walls. Marlon, how you doing today, bro? Man, I knew that question was coming today, (laughs) first of all, but no, I'm doing very, very good. So I guess over the past couple of weeks, I've really been like trying to get very in tune into like what my plan is moving forward to start hitting these revenue goals that I'm setting for myself. And so I'm establishing like different um, strategies to like start creating more, like generating more sales, like within the consulting side of the business, while also simultaneously continuing to put myself out there to make myself more known to where people will be will trust me, to like to um, to run out their cars, like within our business. Because yeah. you know we're in a rental car business, and uh, we we try to continue to reach out to more people and let them know that we um, are first of all we know what we're doing in our, within our business. And secondly, that we can help them out to make passive income as well. So that's what really been what the past couple weeks has been about is identifying that plan and uh, creating a strategy behind all of it. But it's been very, um, very good overall. So as far as I'm doing, I'm just I'm also doing really good because I feel like that plan is becoming solidified now. Yeah. And so how about you? Man, I'm, I'm doing good. I'm happy to be here. I think uh, it was crazy getting set up today for this episode. <laughs> so uh, probably longer yeah. set up time we ever had. Yeah, bro. It's, it's, it's been kind of crazy. But. Every every episode now is pretty much a different setup now. Every couple episodes that you we talk do. about the journey. No, nah, <laughs> that's I'm gonna leave that to you. <laughs> but every every episode we do, man, it's a whole new like set of challenges setting up and you know getting everything prepared. Especially being traveling podcast, traveling all over, you know, getting episodes done. This week we in Houston, and uh, you know we got a couple dope episodes for y'all. Um, and you know we're excited to you know just push these out today too. But other than that, I mean I'm doing good. I'm excited to even be here a, another three hour drive to houston <laughs> so but you know we got we got to get it done you know, y'all already know how we come every episode um production quality is always going to be you know top notch so you know as we say every week if you listen to this go definitely check us out on youtube um we posting out episodes on there every week too and definitely be sure to uh before i, I I'm, I'm gonna say this before we even get into it be sure to definitely um like the podcast like the episode on youtube rate us five stars on uh, Apple Podcasts, if you think it is five stars, if you don't think it's five stars, don't even don't leave a rating. <laughs> I don't even want the rating if it's not if it's not gonna be a five star rating. And uh, definitely subscribe to the YouTube channel as well. So, um, but yeah, man. Other than that, you know, I'm I'm excited to be out here. We we definitely got you know great great episode. But you know, as we do every week, um, I want to get into our uh, business updates. Which, by the way, we didn't last. Like, so now we've because before we didn't we kind of didn't have they didn't have names. Right before the second, oh yeah, the yeah, show, yeah, they, yeah didn't, for sure. they didn't have names, so we kind of segmented the show, and now you know they got names. So our first segment, we talk about the business updates called "Keep Them Posted." That's it. So we keeping y'all posted every single week with what's going on in our business, and like we said on this show every single time, this has been a journey from our you know beginning to where we are now, and where we're going to continue to go for, in terms of our journey for financial freedom. We took y'all to level one when we hit that in September. We're gonna take y'all to level two and level three. As we continue to progress, and that's what the whole keep them posted segment is going to be about. So, um, yeah, let's get into that. It, it's time. To, to, keep them posted. So, Marlon, it's now uh, mid mid November. We pushing quarter four. I guess we halfway through uh, Q four now. Um, we got about ten weeks or eight weeks left. Wait. You know, we got about six weeks left in the year. Yeah, about forty-five days. Yeah, yeah. So <clears throat> it's uh, it's coming. It's cl- we coming to a, a a close quickly. So, how has everything been for you, just in terms of uh, business since we last talked about it, which has been a couple weeks? So, 
you know, just how, I mean, you kind of talked about it earlier. Which, yeah, I, I didn't want to even I, I t- tried to like hint at it, <laughs> but I knew this segment was coming up, so I wanted right. to talk more about it now. So I would say this has been like a calm before the storm as far as for, for, for me and my business because I see you see like of course when it's the holiday season comes into play that's where you can start capitalizing on opportunities so that's one thing that we're pl- I'm planning on implementing as far as within this final push of the toward the end of the year it's going to be yeah. having products and services to uh, be able to put out there for the holiday season but also I was um, so this past couple of weeks I think the week right after um, we I ended up going out to this thing called the morning meetup meetup. So of course you know I'm in the morning meetup uh, with David Shannon, but um, he was hosting a meetup at like in Atlanta for everybody to attend. And so me um, knowing like who is in his network, I said this is a perfect opportunity to get into a room with seven eight figure earners. Oh yeah, because just knowing who he is, he's gonna the people that's in his network. That was a perfect opportunity to go in there and let people know what what I do and how I could be of service to them. And so what I ended up doing was I networked with a couple of, couple of um, the high net worth individuals that were in the room, and I was able to uh, solidify some joint venture partnership opportunities. Dope. So now I think I, we would have at least five different cars that we can bring in just from me being in that room. In and, this past weekend? Yeah, that was just this past weekend. So that was one of my biggest goals while I, I thought, was out there. Wait, you, I thought you was in Atlanta last weekend. So yeah, it last weekend. So I get, I keep thinking, I forget, forget this past weekend even happened because I was laser focused on like setting everything up. So yeah, two weekends ago, I guess, okay. based on when we're talking about it. Yeah. But yeah. Uh, so oh, two. wait. So in real time, not when this releases, Okay. this past weekend you were in Atlanta, like two days ago. No, not two days ago, about 10 days ago. Okay. Got <laughs> yeah. So I forgot what, what day that was, like yeah, was, yeah, whatever yeah. Sunday that was. But yeah, we was out there, I think the 6th or something like that. But yeah, that was one of the things that I was trying to do, get done while I was out there was solidify more joint venture par- partnership connections and then learn how to best put out my digital products for like things such as Black Friday yeah. and, uh, and just and so on and so forth. So one thing that I really did work on as far as like one of my digital products and anybody can go check this out if y'all are interested in like getting into the rental car business we have put together and uh, i think i talked about it before but now i have an entire uh system that uh ho- hosts it now so if y'all are interested in getting into the rental car business and y'all are looking for like just a few steps on like how to automate your systems and processes we have now put out the uh, Re- rebus rental car ebook it's actually called how to automate your rental car business 10 ways to automate it yeah so um we put that ebook out it's actually a lot more intricate now as opposed to what it was the first time I mentioned it so y'all can still go check that out by going to rebusrentalcars.com forward slash ebook and you can uh, check that out so that's one thing that we did put together over the past couple of weeks and um, I think I just I have a bright vision for where this uh, rest of this year is going to end up at so like I said it's a calm before the storm yeah man I mean that's dope I think uh, even being able to get, go out there and we all talk about I mean you got to get in the room Big and time. it's so important to Sometimes you got to pay to get in the room. Most of the time, you actually got to pay to get in the room if you don't have, mm-hmm. you know, any connections to anybody in the room. So, you know, that's that's always huge. I was uh, um, probably am going to be going to Miami in a few weeks to go to Grant Cardone is having a uh, yes sir a uh, you know another event, and so I'm going to definitely go over there and you know network with a lot of people over there. Because obviously, you know, commercial real estate is something that you know that uh, I'm really interested in as well, and I want to make sure that you know. I, the, the thing about commercial real estate is it's not like just you know buying these single family houses small, <laughs> small multi-family and we're gonna talk about a little bit more about that today in our episode Facts. but like it's 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 a it's a it's a it's the big boy game so it's like you got you gotta have a team to take down some of those bigger properties because you know you're buying businesses so um but yeah man that's dope i i think uh getting in the room that's something that a lot of people really need to understand because you, you i think most people don't realize that your best thinking has got you to where you are right now so it's like at the end of the day, he, he, something has to change, right? And oftentimes, the things that change is going to be based off of the either knowledge you gain or the connections you make, or both. Mm-hmm. Usually, it's both. And so, the good thing about being in the room is that you gain the connections and you gain the knowledge. Mm-hmm. Um, and I so, need people to rewind that you, your best <laughs> thinking has got you to where you are today. Yeah, yeah. and that's as far as it's going to get you. That was yeah. To go beyond that, you have to surround yourself with people who think at a higher level. And that's one of the big takeaways I had from that past weekend right. was that people were saying that I thought too small. Really? And I was like, wow. That's, that's why you surround yourself with those type of people because they will stretch you beyond your, whatever you first thought imaginable for yourself. Yeah. Whatever your thinking was at, at your current level, they stretch you to a whole other level. That's why I thought, that's why it's so valuable to get in those rooms. Man. <laughs> <laughs> it's, and, and, and man, I can't wait to get to the episode because you know I know we we gonna have this conversation with our guest today. Facts. Um, and it's gonna be dope. 
but no, nah, I, 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 I'm, I'm excited for everything that you got going on. I think everything you got, you know, going on and what you're doing with the rental car business is dope. And it, just to see it continue to grow and seeing you continue to build your brand up, you know, to and get these joint ventures, man, that's dope, man. So shout out to you for that. Yes, sir. How about how about you and your business, man? What's going on? Keep keep them posted. Yeah, <laughs> nah, man. every everything's been uh good so far. Um, I uh, I just hired um two more uh, customer service reps in the business. And uh, man, it's probably the best decision I have made because it pretty much took me completely out of a lot of the day to day. Um, I hired them last week, so I've been still training them a lot and teaching them a lot. You know, obviously my systems now. This is why we say to create your systems from day one because now the systems that I created from day one, literally from my first couple months in the business last year, are now training these people. Um, and they're learning. I've, I've refined them so many times. They're probably on like the 15th iteration or version of them, but. I, you know, it's still got to a point where like I'm able to um, essentially have my business run the way I want it to run without me having to necessarily mm-hmm. be there in it. And that's the dope thing. So, you know, this I, I really didn't really have too many like my revenue goals for the rest of the year didn't really I, I didn't increase it. Like it was just goal was 50,000 in October. Did that the goal will be 50,000 here. Probably going to do more than that. And then we're going to try to do 50,000 next month as well in uh, December and you know, it's it's definitely already looking, it's already looking promising just based off of uh, how the first two weeks ago. I mean, my phone has been blowing up literally <laughs> since I, I this morning. So and how many just, how many of those calls you answered? None of them. Beautiful. <laughs> <laughs> and so that's 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 the dope thing, man, because it shows just like once you you got to and we you know we beat this dead horse all the time in terms of building systems in the business, but like once you are able to see your systems work for you. I'm telling you, it's a beautiful thing. And it makes all the dollars that I pay, you know, my staff, it makes every dollar worth it. Because now all them calls that I didn't have to take this morning, those were calls I was taking two, three weeks ago even. Mm-hmm. So now taking myself out of the business, it allows me to focus on the bigger tasks, which are now going to be getting to the third location mm-hmm. of the business and continue to scale it. So 2022, it's all about scale, hey. man. It's, it's going to be it's going to be huge next year, man. I'm just so excited. I want to just highlight one thing before we move on to the next segment. First off. People need to understand that people can value time or they can value money. Yeah. And one thing I like to say a lot about this is that people who usually value money tend to make less money. Yeah. Because and that goes for both one, before you get into business and while you're in business. Because before you get into business, are you investing in your information? Are you investing in the knowing how to set the set the business the right way? Yeah. Once you get into the business, are you investing your money into fig, into getting the systems in place, getting the people in place to make it run without your presence? Right. Because now that you can delegate everything, now you can spend the time that's going to get you to the hot the, the um, high income activity, which is going to be how can we get, get to another another location? You're not hiring anybody that's going to get you another location. No. That's that's all what you need to be doing. So you can't hire that particular thing out, but you can't hire out the people that are going to be answering the phone calls, the people that's going to be cleaning the houses. So that's why. So you're investing your money. You may make less money right now, but because you take that momentary cut, now you're going to be able to create an entire ecosystem of people that's working within that business to bring in a lot more money than it is right now because you have the time to do that high income activity. A hundred percent, man. And that's the thing. Like, I don't I don't necessarily focus like most people, they have such a short term mentality about business. Like, I don't care about the money I'm making today. Like the money I can make off of 50,000 a month is nothing compared to the money I can make off of 500,000 a month Mixed facts. from from the business. Right. If the business is making 50,000, cool, I can make, you know, you know, a few thousand dollars a month. If the business is making 500,000 and that's you know serious money and that you can't get to 500,000 by yourself like it, mm. it's not possible like that is 500,000 a month is I don't care who you are like that you cannot run that operation because that's in my business the cleaning business that's over <laughs> that's how many let's see that's at least times 10 so it's pushing 2,000 houses a month so there's no way I'm running that by myself. That, that's a team of Imagine, uh, imagine taking people. 2,000 calls a month. And that's just the people that that booked. Yeah, that's, <laughs> so you take 30% of that. So that's times three. That's probably seven, 8,000 calls a month. 6,000 calls luck. a month. So, yeah, man. I mean, that, that, that is, come on. At the end of the day, fo- focus on building your systems from day one so that now once you, you can grow into them. And that's mm-hmm. what I've been able to do. I grew into the systems I've established and I've continue, I'm continuing to refine. I literally set up a software that... I'm now pretty much creating I'm the people I've hired, I'm now pretty much I have I created an SOP to teach them how to create an SOP. 
Mm. And I create a system to teach them how to create a system. Because now some things they're going to experience that I necessarily didn't that experience. That you haven't seen before. So yeah. now when they see it they and they figure out a way to do it, they can create a system around that. So that's just where I'm at in the business, man. And I'm, 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 you know, I'm blessed and it's, it's, it's dope. So closing off the year, is I'm excited to, um, you know, get to where we're going to be and open up 2022 because it's going to be crazy, man. So Big facts. But uh, yeah, man, that's uh, our uh, business updates for this week, man. Um, we do have a fantastic episode for y'all today. Like I said, we are in Houston, Texas, where if y'all don't know, Houston has some of the heaviest hitters, especially in the real estate game out here, man. And every time we come out here, we connect with them. And it's it's just super dope to always just stay connected with these kind of people. Because I'm telling you, just like we talked about getting in the room, I'm telling you all, the podcast is really cheap because that's a way we kind of get in the room without necessarily having to get in the room. So it's, uh, it's, 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 it's super dope. So today we have a special guest on the show. Uh, Mr. TJ, how are you doing today, sir? Man, I am doing great. I'm doing great. I'm blessed. My bad. I'm trying to make sure I'm safe yeah, <laughs> you for, my, for, my, for my folks over here, my followers. So, no, everything is great. I'm blessed, man. I appreciate y'all having me on. This is great. And just listening to y'all's uh, business update, I'm encouraged. Yeah. <laughs> I'm encouraged. I'm inspired, man. So, great stuff that y'all have going on. That's amazing, yes, man. So, appreciate y'all having me on. Yeah, real. we appreciate you, bro. We appreciate you. Marlon, can you kind of, uh, as far as, because I know you... Can you let the people know how we how you kind of connected with TJ and you know how we got him on the show? Yeah, so first of all, this is why it's so this is why the podcast is a cheat code because we may not even have been able to get in touch with this young man if we hadn't known other people that that he also knew beforehand. So if we we knew we've had O'Neill Parker on the show before, right? We've had Brandon Narain on the show. We've also had um, B- Byron um, Holman. All those guys are networked with TJ. My guys. So not see my my, my, guys. my guys. So <laughs> that, that that's a way so you can you can network with, with one person who can get you into a, a, a network of somebody else. Mm-hmm. They, like every people that that you meet, they know other people, and so that's how you are able to like scale like the people that you are able to network with because you know some you know one person. So yeah. that's why you always want to uh, maintain the relationship with your connections. That way, um, you can uh, start leveraging their network. They can leverage your network, and y'all can build value to each other. Yeah, absolutely. And so. Uh, we, so, like I said, first, first of all, we're very glad to have you. Thanks for showing Appreciate up today. You. Appreciate you. And um, I guess we can really get started, like we just with our with the show. So, the way we start every show is that we always like to go into the background of our guests to figure out like how what their uh, background was with money growing up, uh-huh. as far as like household and things like that, uh-huh. and kind of uh, how that transitioned to what you uh, do today. Oh, fantastic, fantastic! So for me, my background, I'm actually a hundred um, percent. Native born Nigerian guy. Okay. Yeah, shout out to Nigerian Africa. Job boy. Anyway, so uh, born born in Nigeria. I uh, came to Houston, moved to Houston when I was eight years old. And I've been in Houston ever since. Uh, so I'm a Houston guy uh, through and through. I uh, went. I also graduated from the University of Houston. Uh, go Cougs, my folks out there in H-Town. Mm-hmm. Um, so, and and for me, you know, coming, coming down here when I was eight years old, we didn't have much at all. We moved into a uh, a small apartment complex. It was me and my four siblings. So it was five of us and my mom, and uh, we moved into a small apartment complex next to family. And we we were good. We were we were happy. Didn't have much at all. Uh, I remember my, my, the first car that we got was what we called a hunchback. It only had one like two two doors. And the back seat was only two seats, like it's a really tiny car. And it had the two front seats. And we found a way to pack ourselves in there. Somehow, some way, my mom, when we all wanted to go somewhere, Chuck E. Cheese or whatever, we found a way. And, Y'all uh, was going to check, after household was going to yeah, Chuck E. Cheese. We were going to Chuck E. Cheese. But, you know, somebody had to put us on. We, somebody had to put my mom on oh, to Chuck okay. E. Cheese. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's so, right there. Yeah, that's a network right there. Already in motion. Right, anyway, I know so, that. Uh, so that was, uh, that was interesting. That was interesting. But then, you know, uh, I remember... Growing up, it was tough. Growing up was tough. And by the way, you know, we see each other, and I see boys out here lifting. Like boys out here and shaking. <laughs> and we know what's that talk so about that, man. We think that our arms right. We usually the big ones on the show. <laughs> so you walking hey, in man. like, God dang. <laughs> so I, I am, you know, I, I'm at the gym every morning. I worked out today. Yeah. Um, and But I didn't always look like this. I was a very scrawny hey, kid, tiny. <laughs> <laughs> if you, I, I was a very scrawny kid. And um, so, you know, growing up, you know, Getting picked, you know, the whole bullying, picked on, being African. Uh, you know, I had the the big head with the big ears, with a tiny body, uh, with the huge lips. And what uh, was what was the? Because you know, I mean, I, I'm I'm Kenyan as well. So nice, yeah. what was 
Well, and you don't have to say this, but like, what what were some of the things that you heard? Oh my god! Because I, I just want to hear. Oh, this. If it was, if so it was, I want to resonate with you. Oh my god! I'm talking about I'm talking about uh, you know I mean the Africa booty scratch yeah, that's just a staple. A, yeah, I mean right. you know that's a staple. You know. Um, <laughs> hey man, I got I got the burnt biscuit all the time. Bro. <laughs> hey. hey. <laughs> Hey, when you the thing is, is that it's beyond just being Nigerian, bro. Being African, like That's what I'm when saying. you got other things like massive lips and <laughs> and big ears. Oh man, they just had a field day with it. And I remember growing up, you know, when when it was time in high school. I wanted to go to college. I really wanted to go to school. I wanted to go to college, but you know, my family didn't have any money to go to college. Yeah. And at the time, I wasn't even a citizen, so I couldn't get any scholarships. Matter of fact, I I qualified for like the maximum financial aid possible. Couldn't get it. Wow. I couldn't. They wouldn't even give me loans. They wouldn't really? give me student loans uh, what because year was this? because I wasn't a citizen. This was uh, let's see. I graduated high school two thousand six. Oh, okay. Um. So I couldn't even get student loans, and um. So then. My mom, I, I, my mom was like, well, how are you going to go to school? I said, I don't know. I'm going to find a way. So I got into literally every school I applied to. I was a f- top 5% of my class in high school, um, but everybody wanted me to pay out of state. Uh-huh. Um, so I got into University of Houston, and we took a class trip to University of Houston. I loved it. I wanted to go there. It was going to be close to home, close to my mom. I was able to help out home. Um, but, uh, you know, they wanted me to pay out of state. And so there was, and I was rush through it, but there was a, there was a guy that came and visited our, our high school campus and he, uh, his name is Mr. Woodson. And I talked to him and he spoke to our, co- I was in a college prep class, yeah. which was called AVID. Uh, it was like, you know, like the gifted and whatever, take AP classes, the whole nine. And after he spoke to our class, I went up to him and I said, Hey, Mr. Woodson, I really want to go to school, but I'm trying to figure out how I'm going to go. And this is my situation. And I told him what was going on with me. He said, hey, I need you to, uh, uh, let's meet up. Uh, I got some forms I need you to fill out and get notarized and bring them back to me. I need original copies. So I did exactly what he what he told me to do. I didn't have a license, and I drove to University of Houston. <laughs> yes, wow. it was the longest drive I've ever taken at the time. <laughs> it took me like an hour to get there. I drove to University of Houston, met up with him, took all the forms he gave me, got it notarized at the bank across the street from my house, drove back to University of Houston, gave it to him. They didn't have a license. <laughs> and... Uh, and literally two weeks later, I was granted in-state tuition. How wow. he did it, I don't know. So how, so that that's half the battle then, yeah. right? And so now I still got to pay for school. Right? So, But, you know, and I, was, I signed up for orientation. I'm excited. I'm signing up for orientation. Matter of fact, I received the Dell Scholarship in high school, which is $20,000 to go to college, mm. wow. plus a free Dell laptop. Wow. And they took it away. <laughs> They took it away because I didn't have the papers. I wasn't a citizen. Uh, so that was heartbreaking. Yeah. But I signed up for school, went to orientation. My mom was like, how, what's up? How? How? <laughs> <laughs> My mom was like, how are you How are you going to go to school? Like, how? Why are you? I said, mom, I'm going to figure it out. She said, you signed up for orientation. You signed up for classes. I said, I'm not sure, but I'm going to go. So I went to orientation and I met with the financial aid office. And I said, hey, what options do y'all have? Like, like, I came pretty far, but what options do I have? And they said, well, you can defer all your tuition payments to the end of the semester. Mm-hmm. You just have to pay interest on it. Yeah. Right? Because they want their money up front. And I said, okay, cool. How much is the interest? It's 5% interest. I said, okay, that's not too bad. So I did that. I was deferring all my payments. I started working. I worked at, at a shoe store working at Foot Action selling shoes. I took up a job on campus tutoring math. I was doing that. Then I took up a third job. I took wow. up a third job while working, while going to school full time teaching uh, high school kids to pass their SATs. So I was doing all that working like probably 40, 50 hours a week. Wow. Right? As a full-time student. As a full-time right? student, wow. taking 13, 15-hour classes. And so I had no time to do anything, but I was working. And literally, I would save my money, and that's how I was paying my tuition. And I would wait till the end of the semester, I will put my money together, and I will pay my tuition at the end of every semester. Really? And that's how I was able to put myself through school. I graduated with an engineering degree, mechanical engineering and mathematics, and uh, started working oil and gas after after college, working oil and gas. And my boy, one of my frat brothers, he came and said, hey, TJ, I read this book, bro. You got to read this book. I said, what book is it? He said, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Oh, here we go. You got right. <laughs> so uh, before you continue, how yeah. long was it, was it after you got out of college? Out of this college? was, I graduated college 2012. Mm-hmm. This was literally that, like that year, like that December. Hey, so, wait, so did you graduate in December? or I graduated in May 2012. In May? Okay, so, okay. so you, when after. did you start working? 
I started, oh, May 2012. Okay. I, I, I had a full-time offer literally right at, and that's a whole nother story. But anyway. <laughs> so you worked six, about six months six in. Months yeah. But yeah. before six, months in. Yes. getting introduced to. Before getting to, introduced right. into, into anything entrepreneurship, period. Yeah. Right. right. And my first entrepreneurship journey, for one, I was in the fitness. I was working out. Right. And I wanted to own a gym. That was my first thing that I wanted to do. I wanted to own a gym. Um, I was looking to franchising gyms and Anytime Fitnesses and mm -hmm. all that. And I actually was really close to signing a deal, but they wanted me to open one like in Conroe. I was trying to open one in Houston. Mm -hmm. They said, no, we focus on markets that are outskirts. While you were in school, right after no, you graduated? No, this is, this is me being an engineer. Oh, this, is me being, okay. this is like the first kind of business is, that's your, okay, venture I was right, looking okay. to get into. Then I read the book, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. <laughs> My boy told me to read it. And I, and at the time, I was working offshore. As an engineer, I worked out on oh, the gas. rigs in oil and gas. I was working, I was a substance installations engineer. So you um, was making good money. I was making six figures out of college. Easy. Okay. Yeah, never, yeah. It, never seen that kind of money in my life. Yeah. Six figures out of college, but it cost me my time. Yeah. I was gone about sixty percent of the year, sixty-five sometimes. Oh, offshore. Man. Offshore, working offshore. So, so y'all on here. the rigs. On the rigs. Oh, you was. Oh, I was yeah. working. Bro, I was. I was. I was a subsistence license engineer. I was like literally at the face of the economy, like the the equipment that is used to to extract crude oils and yeah. hydrocarbons from subsea. My job was to install these equipment subsea. Wow. So I would oversee the design. I would yeah. oversee the procedures to create them. And then once they go subsea, I'll be in the RV room with all the TVs and, and directing the robots on what to do. Underwater. I, I, I was the one direct, uh, actually physically doing it. They had RV technicians to do that, but I was telling them what to do. Open yeah. this valve, close this valve, do that. So that was my job. Wow. <laughs> that was what I did. I didn't hate it. I no, didn't hate it. Dope. It was a pretty cool job. I had yeah. a chance to travel. I was doing a lot. I, I went to Norway, um, traveled there, did some pretty dope um, uh, stints in um, my Portugal. Yeah. Uh, man, it was pretty cool. So you were probably cool. working for like one of the Fortune 500 companies. Yes, yeah, so it was for, it was for t well, now they're, they're oh, I don't know if I can say the name of it. Yeah, no, you don't have to. Okay. <laughs> I was about to I drop it heavy. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, I, you know, I did that. And I did that for five years. Yeah. I did that for five years. I was promoted in between to a lead engineer. Um, so I did that. And my goal at the time, so when, when he told me to read that book, I bought that book. And I took it offshore with me in one of my hitches. I was at that. I was. I was at the hitch when I say hitch. That stint, right yeah. before I came back. I was. At, I was on that stint for three weeks, and I read that book twice while I was there. Wow! In that three week span. In that three week span. Wow. And how old were you at this time? By the way, I was. Uh, I was twenty four. So I graduated college at twenty four. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So a little later than most people. Yeah. But I took me six years to graduate college. How many times? Twenty twelve. It's a little later than most people. How many people ever read Rich Dad? Right. Right. And if they do, they're like fifty years. This old. Is so this is true. This is true. This is true. <laughs> so I. Um, so I read that book offshore and I couldn't get off that boat fast enough. Mm. I was like, get me off this boat. <laughs> I need to go own some assets now. Yeah, ASAP. Man. <laughs> like not N O W. Nah, N E E. Right, right. <laughs> well, I, was about, I was trying to get to the back. I'm trying to get to the assets yeah. ASAP. So I started investing in real estate on the side. I got started um, um, buying and holding. That was the first strategy that it was like owning assets, right? Cash flow. So yeah. I was like, I want to buy and hold real estate. Yeah. So I started learning about buying and holding real estate investing. I joined a local real estate group. I started going on YouTube University. I, I mean, I'm, I'm just educating myself. I'm, I'm in the literally, I'll get off work. And even when I was offshore, it's, and what sucks is that the watch, the signals is horrible offshore. Yeah. But at every chance I get, I took books out there with me. I was whenever I'm at home, I'm YouTube University. I'm studying this game, and then I got into wholesaling. Bought a course. I spent seven grand. Bought a course with a coach on wholesaling real estate. Mm -hmm. And so my first my first deal came two weeks after I bought that course. Yeah. Wow. Two weeks after I bought that course, my first deal came, and I made seventy five hundred dollars on that deal. Wow. So, so I paid myself back, back essentially yeah. what I what I what I invested and I started running it up from there. And so this I was, was twenty thirteen. This was twenty thirteen twenty thirteen getting to exactly. Yeah. 2013. You read that book in December oh, 2012, oh 2013. It was, it, was, it, was, it, was, it was it was a wrap after that. I, that's all I needed to see. Yeah. And so and so then um so after that, you know, started doing real estate and my goal was to own ten rental properties. I said, I want ten rental properties, I'm gonna walk away from this job. That was my goal, um, because did you have like a cash flow goal, or it was just like ten properties? That number. But well, to me, I learned that financial freedom isn't necessarily a number. Yeah. Right. I learned that financial freedom is more so about how you live yeah. and your personal expenses. If your side income that yeah. you're not working for every day, not your earned income, but more so your side income slash passive income, once it meets your expenses, by definition, you're financially free. Exactly. So for me. That was the goal. I said 10 rental properties will put me there and then some, 
right? Because I was leaving very low. My expenses were super low. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, living like that'll put me there, and then some. That was where it was comfortable for me to walk away from the job. Yeah. Well, the oil and gas market tanked 2015, 16 really, 16 it tanked, and 2017 they just didn't have any projects. When you when the, when the cost wow. of, of oil per barrel cost forty two dollars, but the cost to produce it cost forty six. Yeah. Nobody's drilling. Yeah. No, but nothing's happening. Yeah. So we didn't have enough projects to support the amount of engineers on our team. So literally the day I was laid off, it was like 72 people got laid off that day. It was when layoffs were going rampant in the oil and gas industry. 2015. This is, so this is 2017 when I was laid off. June 1st, 2017 was the day I was you laid off. never forget that. Oh, no. Nah. <laughs> so, um, but instead of looking for another job, I decided to better myself. Now, when I was laid off, I had five rental properties instead of 10. I was halfway there, halfway into my goal. In Houston. In Houston. Yeah. All in Houston. Um, so then, and... Decided to better myself. Then I learned I didn't want to know anything about short-term rentals. I wasn't necessarily looking for it. I was gonna just rank up my wholesaling business and do, get into creative deals. And then I found saw a video about making money through Airbnb. I was mm-hmm. like, what is this about? I mean, I know about Airbnb. I never even stayed in one yet, but I know about it. And this is 2017. This is 2017. So Airbnb is not Airbnb as is. like hot as it is today. Correct. Not nearly as much. Oh no, but it was still. It, I mean, nah, nah. It definitely yeah. wasn't. Hasn't taken the 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 grounds roots that it has now. Yeah, Absolutely right. not. But it was still popping at the right, time. Sure, right. um, very much so. So I launched my first short-term rental December 2017. This is a property that I own. Instead of putting a traditional tenant in it, which I do most of the properties I purchase, I decided to furnish it and make it a short-term rental property. And at the time, I was scared as heck, and I didn't know what I was doing. And I spent 14 grand to furnish a three-bedroom, two-bath house, wow. and I wasn't even sure this thing was going to work. i never forget when I listed my very first property, I... I sat in my house, I listed it, then I sat in my house and I started to put on a movie, I put on a, a Planet of the Apes and I was just watching, I put my phone down, I just, I just put a face down, I was nervous. And literally within 10 minutes, I got a ping. It wasn't even a booking, mm-hmm. it was just an inquiry though. They were just asking questions about one of the rooms. I was like, yes, it's perfect, it's ready, book it. I got you, it's good, it's good. And they didn't end up booking it. But I woke up the next day with two bookings. Oh, wow. And I said, interesting, this is interesting because if I was even at 50% occupancy and I priced it low, right? Like yeah, I priced yeah. it low. Even at 50% occupancy at that price, I was still looking to make twice as much as I would have made with, with a long term rental. Oh, wow. So I was like, man, you know what? There's something here. Then I started, I, I mean, for me, it was a no brainer. This is the game I want to play in, and this is the lane I want to stay in. And for me, before then, I was really all over the place. Like, I didn't know what I really wanted to really focus on, even though I had success. But for me, I was doing everything. And I didn't get, I mean, I was getting somewhere, but not nearly as fast as I got there when I got focused on one thing. Here we go. So when I got focused on one thing, I said, I'm going all in to this strategy. When I went all in, now I'm doing a lot of other things. (laughs) But because I was able to focus on one thing, it allows me to do a lot of other things now. But I was focused on one thing at first. Yeah. And so um, so this this business changed my life. It really did. It transitioned me from uh from to, to really be like an entrepreneur. So what so we what we're gonna do, I wanna know what it looks like today and then we're gonna kinda go back and Absolutely. unwind. We're gonna unpack a lot of stuff you just talked about. Yeah. So what does the kind of the business look like today as far as how many short term rental properties mm-hmm. you got? How does you know how much you let's count your pockets? Just you know, a bit. how much you feel like sharing? <laughs> so, um, so I started with one unit, um, and here's the thing about short term rentals. You know, I actually own. I'm, I'm what you consider a landlord host. Okay. Meaning, I own um, my short term rentals, but I also execute a known strategy called rental arbitrage. Mm-hmm. Meaning, I rent these properties. I'm yeah. not. Um, I'm not owning them. You yeah. don't have to own them. I rent them on a on a corporate lease, a business lease, long term business lease. And I re-rent the property out short term. Right. Right. Um, so essentially, for me now, what it looks like, most of my portfolio, about 60% of my portfolio I own. Mm-hmm. About 40% I rent. Um, my goal was to make that more 50-50, but it's probably going to become more like 70-30. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I'm buying more assets. I just right. keep buying more real estate. Yeah. And my goal, my focus now is to buy uh, multifamily properties that I'm essentially gonna reposition to turn them into like essentially boutique hotels. Oh, dope. Um, so I uh, recently started my first boutique hotel project now. Um, we got into, started that probably about a month and a half ago. Uh, we're probably looking to be done at the start of the summer next year. So long project is a full gut, yeah. 13 doors. Wow. Um, 
in the heart of the tray, third ward. Um, we're gutting it full gut, and we're repositioning at a boutique hotel. Um, I have on a contract now another eight unit, literally like four minutes away from there, and uh, we're going to do the same thing there. So, and we're going to be buying a lot more of these kind of assets, bigger assets going into the next year. So, um, so that's the plan. That's the plan. So now, thirty plus units up and running, sixty um, percent under ownership, forty percent under rental arbitrage. Mm -hmm. And I started just twenty seventeen, December twenty seventeen. I launched my first one, which is one single family house. And then I learned rental arbitrage. Bought did, did did rental arbitrage. My next one did another rental arbitrage. Then bought another duplex. Bought another duplex. Did more rental arbitrage. Bought yeah. another multifamily. Did more rental arbitrage. How I like to do it is I like to buy my properties with other people's money. Yeah. I buy them with other people's money. Yeah. Then I gut it. Then I remodel it. I'm, I buy them from. I make. I buy them from ugly. Then I make them beautiful. Yeah. In the process of making them beautiful, I'm picking up arbitrage units mm. while I'm fixing it up. And so that's how I was able to scale as fast as I've been able to scale now. Wow. And I, I, taught, I taught my first class the tail end of 2018. I had people come to my Airbnb, say, hey, don't, don't even, you know, don't, don't take my word for it. Come look at it. Come <laughs> see it. Look at the setup. Look at it. Touch it. See how everything's going. Look at the numbers. And I started, that's how I started educating folks about this business model. Right. And so now, you know, we have, a, we have built a sweet, sweet, amazing community, the Short Term and the Roadmap community, yeah. uh, where we're just, we're just taking people and, and just changing their lives with this business. Man, so that's, that's what it's about now. That's dope, bro. That's so dope. And so now, so, man, so much to understand. Because I think just from the beginning, so now you've been in real estate now pretty close to 10 years now. Man, so I started my first, I, I bought my first property to hold. Right? I bought my first property to hold 2014. Okay. Okay. So it's because it's it was wholesaling back in 2013. Okay. Yeah. 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 Okay. So, so, so you've been an investor for almost eight, wow. years, yeah. about eight years now. Yeah. And that's, that was, I mean, you, I when you started, that, long, that was like at the, the market was completely different from how it is today when you yeah. started. Like yeah. it's literally on probably 180, 180 degree different, like yeah. literally. But, I just think the whole your whole story is so dope though because like I don't know I really resonated with a lot a lot of it too because when your friend so when your friend he he gave you he told you about rich dad poor dad mm -hmm. now at this time what was your friend doing uh, he's an engineer civil we went to engineer school together <laughs> yo this is nuts <laughs> this is hilarious <laughs> this is nuts Reason started laughing so I'm a mechanical engineer oh yeah. yeah he's civil engineer wow and we both graduated college in December of 2017. Wow. January 2018, he tells me about Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Civil wow. engineer, mechanical. Wow. Same <laughs> exact thing. This is interesting. <laughs> Same exact thing. And hey, shouts out to Junius, man. That's my boy that put me on Rich Dad, Facts, Poor Dad. Man. Yeah, for sure, man. And so it's, I, I, I love that, though. So well, I think it would be dope for a lot of people to see someone in your position and like understand like how yeah. you actually got your first deal, yeah. your first property. And, and yeah. you know how did that actually look? Why so, he was... You know, working still. So in this in this group that I was in, they had like these agents that would if you in the in the network, I spent five grand in this group, by the way. Spent five so we're talking about educate like <laughs> you gotta invest in your education. Yeah. I spent five grand to be a part of this group. Get in the room. And to get in the room. And they had a network of uh contractors, title companies, agents that you can work with. So I just kind of built a relationship with agents in the network and they were just sending me deals. They were just sending me deals before they listed them. You know what I mean? So then that's how I was able to get that first deal. But I think it's important to note, I bought that first deal with my money. That's important to note. Yeah. Now I buy real estate with my time. Okay. Now I buy real estate with my time. I bought that first deal with my money, meaning it was a turnkey property. It didn't need anything. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It was ready to go. It was a three bedroom, two bath house. Um, bought it for $92,000, put 20% down. Okay. I put 20% down. Between the time of me closing it to the point of it cash flowing, it took only two weeks. I listed it. I sifted through all the applicants that came in like a flick and flood rush. Mm -hmm. I sifted through all of the applicants. Took me a, took me a few days. They were they moved in, gave me first month's rent security deposit two weeks after I bought that property. Wow. Two weeks after. So my I was, they were paying twelve forty in rent. My mortgage was eight forty a month. Yeah. So that delta, that difference, that's my cash flow. Mm -hmm. Right. Um so that I bought with my money. Then take, for example, my very first short term rental property. I bought it for a hundred and no, I bought it for uh, yeah, I bought it for they what they wanted one fifteen. I bought it for ninety thousand needed a full gut is in a horrible shape <laughs> horrible yeah. shape now but once the property is fixed up it's worth 240 mm -hmm. right but it needed i put 60 to 65 thousand into the remodel something like that and i fixed it up to where it's pristine then i refinanced it with a local bank 
Mind you, I use private money to do all this, not not a dollar. Matter of fact, not only not only do I use private money to buy it, you know, when you use hard money or private money, you still you still owe interest only payments. Yeah. You still gotta make payments every single month. The deal was so sweet, I was able to roll in four months worth of the interest only payments into the front end of the loan. Yeah. What does this mean? Meaning I'm not making any payments while I'm remodeling right. this property. So I was able to remodel it, no money out of my pocket. Refinance it, no money out of my pocket. Matter of fact, I got paid when I refinanced it. <laughs> I got paid. So now my loan balance on the property is like, well, what was like 160 something, but it was worth. And then once I got it refinanced, <laughs> we got a reappraisal, appraised at 255. So it even came in a little bit higher than the initial appraisal. Right. Wow. So I got a property that's worth 255, but I got a loan balance of 160. And I paid no money out of my pocket. Then I probably started bringing in $7,000 a month on Airbnb. Man. That's the play. So now I do this at a higher level. Yeah. That's what I do. And this. See, and that's so essentially what that's all is like creative financing, right? Creative real estate financing, creative because there's so many strategies to get into real estate and finance deals. Yeah. And one thing you did mention, I think is super critical. You mentioned how you know you did your first deal with your own money. Mm -hmm. um, now, I think today there's so like there there's always been so many different ways to get into real estate without ever even needing mm -hmm. a dollar of your own money, mm -hmm. whether you want to do wholesaling or buy and hold or flipping, whatever the case may be. There's so mm -hmm. many different ways. But what you essentially did, especially on that short term rental deal, was you combined a whole bunch of different things like yeah. hard money, private money, yeah. traditional financing, yes. all of that into one deal. That is what it means to get a deal done by any means necessary. It's like <laughs> I'm going to figure out a way because the thing about it is like with obviously with traditional banks, they don't want to lend on properties right. that are dilapidated and not, you know, in habitable conditions. So you take private money. You take hard money, now you can combine those two things and now you can essentially do deals with no yeah. money because now it's either relationship based lending or it's institutional based lending Absolutely. that lends. Absolutely. Asset. And that what I that's what I actually consider buying real estate with your time. Because yeah. from the point of purchasing that asset to the point that it starts making me money, that took time. Yeah. I had to fix it up. Mm. I had to close with a private I had to order the appraisal. The appraisal got done. Put up with a construction budget, meet with the meet with the contractor, put all that together. Then send it over to your appraiser. Appraiser, appraise all that stuff. Then we fixed it up. Mm -hmm. Then after we fix it up, we got to refinance it, which takes about another month to do. Yeah. So it took three months from the point of closing it right. to the point of cash flow. Mm -hmm. Three months. But it didn't cost me any of my money. Right. But it did cost me my time. Right. Because I still oversaw the project and oversaw the whole thing all the way through. So that asset I bought with my time versus mm -hmm. the first asset. From the point of closing order to point of cash flow, it was a turnkey profit. Didn't need any work. I had to put down twenty percent because of that. So I bought it with my money versus my time. So I educate people on how to buy real estate with your time. Yeah. Learn how to buy real estate with your time. Learn how to use other people's money mm -hmm. to buy these assets. Because at the end of the day, you don't you don't have to set the real estate world on fire to to build crazy wealth. Yeah. You can do it part time. You learn how to buy real estate with your time, and you do two of these deals a year part time. That's very doable part time. You do two of these deals a year. In five years, what do you have? You have 10 houses. Say you yep. sell five and pay off the other five. In year, year, uh, year six. Now you have five free and clear houses because you put a plan in motion and you stuck with the plan and you ran the play. Now you have five free and clear houses. That's a retirement. Man. <laughs> That's retirement. Yeah. Not a 401k. You know? <laughs> Can we, can, we, can, we, can we speak on it? Oh, talk about it. Trust me, if, if we can talk on that anywhere, this is the place where we, there's no shaming a 401. Like, we, we gladly shame a 401. Like, there's no issue with that. Yeah. Because you mentioned earlier that you have a portfolio now between owned assets mm -hmm. as well as the rental arbitrage yep. one. So I, really, I had a couple questions that I wanted to ask, be, primarily because a lot of people are going to be looking to get into short-term rentals mm -hmm. and they're trying to compare the two options. Mm -hmm. And so now they have to start comparing and contrasting yep. which one is going to be the best one for me to get into right now. So yeah. like, based on my current situation, let's say that I don't have a lot of money mm -hmm. and I want to like go and I want to go like to a apartment complex. I don't mm -hmm. know if this how, if it's the process. Do you go to an apartment complex and say that you want to uh, do like a sublease or something mm -hmm. like that? How mm -hmm. does that process work for you? Cool, cool. So great question, great question. Well, for one, I think regardless of either or, whether you want to do rental arbitrage or you want to own, um, for one, the answer is yes. If I say, Tisha, what do you want to do? You, do, you, do you prefer rental arbitrage or ownership? 
Yes is the answer. Both. <laughs> both. Okay, both. They both have pros and cons, but I, I don't care. There are people that I know that I'm really good friends with that built million, multi-million dollar short-term rental businesses without owning any single one of these properties, right. literally. Um, but even though that's the case, um, I still want people to still place a pretty high value on ownership. That's awesome. Right. It's that should be the goal. Um, whether you want to do rental arbitrage or not, whether you want to do rental arbitrage, your goal should be to own your assets mm -hmm. at the end of the day. So um, I recommend for folks who have limited resources in terms of capital, um, uh, maybe even a limited network, whatever the case may be, you don't need too much of either to really to really get this thing going. The barrier to entry when you do a rental arbitrage is pretty low. Right. So I would recommend to start with rental arbitrage. And I recommend to, to start and actually if you do it, like do it, do it. Like do it for real. Um, and, and learn the game. Get educated because there's a lot of facets in doing this business and doing it the right way. For one, a lot of people feel like, oh, it's Airbnb. Just put a property up on Airbnb. Mm -hmm. Well, that's not even where the value is. The fact that you that's that's where you, for one, you don't want to base your entire business and all the bookings and your revenues from one platform. I don't right. care how popular that platform mm, is. Right. You know what I'm saying? So we, we consider that a single point of failure, which we don't want to succumb Ooh, ourselves that's to. That's good right there. Right? So we want to make sure that we have multiple eyes in different facets. And especially in this short-term rental game right now, in the way things are going, you should also be focused on building your own brand. Mm. Building your own hospitality brand, get your own people, build your own email list, get your own direct booking on, site. Man. People should be booking with you direct, not relying on Airbnb. So do you, you sit, utilize like SEO? Like oh uh, yeah. So 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 we we definitely do one hundred percent. And I like to let people know that that stuff like that is important because that's what the value is. Right. The value isn't in Airbnb. The yeah, value is in on. your business model. You the value is in Airbnb. infrastructure. Exactly. You you uh, you. Uh, your value is in your infrastructure. Mm -hmm. It's in the systems that you have. Because if you do this business right, you're actually building a sellable business. Yeah. Right. But it's not sellable if it's not structured properly. If you yeah. don't have systems, you don't have you don't have the infrastructure, it's not sellable. Right. And so that's where the value is. You know, people I have I have friends that sold uh, one one particularly comes to mind. Her name is Julie. She's super cool. Um, she <laughs> sold her short term rental business. She didn't own that one property. Well, what the heck did she sell? She sold her business yes. for multiple M's, for millions. Wow. She grew her business up to 200 units and sold it. The business. She didn't own any of it. She didn't own that one property. Sold the business for multiple M's. Why? Because she sold the infrastructure, yeah. the business itself. And that's where the value is in this, in this, in this game. Yeah. It's not so much on Airbnb or whatnot. But kind of focus on more on your question. Yes, 100%. You want to, uh, when you do rental arbitrage, you want to have these conversations. Matter of fact, I recommend folks to start with what I like to consider owner control properties. Um, owner control properties are like, could be a single family home all the way up to like a 50 unit property. These are smaller buildings, smaller properties that, um, when I say smaller, not small in size, just small in numbers and the number of right. units. Um, because you have a way better chance of dealing with the person directly in charge. Mm -hmm. Versus a REIT, REIT apartment complexes, we like to consider them REITs. Your chances with them are are are, are decreased quite drastically. Why? Okay, because they have policies in place. They are structured. They have like rules in place. They are structured like a company. Those are businesses. They're you businesses. Like businesses. Like a mom and pop owner for absolutely, like, absolutely. Your your chances with them are a lot better than like an apartment complex. They have a lot more requirements, mm -hmm. and uh, most apartment complexes now un because unfortunately. There are more people doing this business wrong than doing it right. Yeah. Facts. So what that yeah. means is that people are getting into these apartment complexes and not doing it right and leaving a bad taste in their mouth. Like they, they're they now stricter. They are now aware of what's going on. They, a lot of the calls they get, hey, do y'all allow Airbnb? That's like the number one question. When they call me, they're like, hey, why is it that somebody can call an apartment complex and ask if they do Airbnb and they get denied, but I call them and I get approved? Yeah. Right, I call them negative because I have the right infrastructure built out. Yeah, I have the right systems, and I'm able mm -hmm. to convey my business model perfect, like the they, right way. And they see the systems, they see, I, they see other listings, they have referrals, they have, they see my DMB profile, my right. Dunn and Bradshaw profile, they see my trade references. Like these are things that they look for. But see, if you were to work with an owner control person, they don't require your entity to be established for a year or two. They don't require you to have three trade references on your Dunn and Bradstreet profile. Wow. Like these are things that apartment complexes look for, wow. but they don't necessarily require these things. So your, your, your factor or your positioning factor with them more so to get the yes is your conversation. 
Mm-hmm. How well do you position yourself as an as an expert yeah. that does this for real? How well do you convey and 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 hit on all the pain points that matter to them? Like you got to be able to put yourself in the shoes of a landlord yeah. and address what's important to them. How do they get paid? Right? Is it going to be automated? I let them know. Hey, we get we. We're going to pay you. It's going to be automated. Like, it's going to be every month. It's going to be automated. Matter of fact, look at these automated payments we've made to other landlords in the past. Mm-hmm. Like, look at them. We'll show them the freaking bank statement. <laughs> <laughs> look at them. Um, show them how insurance is going to be handled, right? Because we, it's not just like a regular landlord policy or a rental's policy. Like, we get the right insurance, a short term rental yeah. policy. And we let them know that it comes with uh, a general aggregate liability. And we can add them on as an additional insurer, them or their business, whether whatever entity they own the property in. You know what I'm saying? So things like that, conversations like that is what matters, yeah. right? Show them how it's supposed to show. Like we let them know the property has to show and look clean for every single person that comes in here. Mm-hmm. So who's going to take care of it better than we are? Nobody's going to take care of this property the way we are. Our goal is to essentially show them that we are the perfect tenant. Yeah, man, and that's the goal. And man, I love I love that answer because you framed it from the perspective of adding value to the apartment complex and showing the apartment complex that it's beneficial for you, for me to actually yeah. be doing this here. Yeah, yeah. As opposed to most people, and they call, "Hey, do y'all do Airbnb?" I know if I'm an apartment complex owner, if I'm a property manager, Boy, you're on my line, yeah. because I already know the type. If that's how you already that's reaching how you, out, exactly. I already know the type of person, exactly. the type of business you're gonna run here. Man, yeah, I don't want you here, bro. I don't even say. You know what's crazy? Airbnb <laughs> don't even come out of my mouth, bro. Right. Airbnb doesn't even come out of my mouth in any conversation on the phone or in person. Yeah. It doesn't even come out of my. We don't even use that word when, when we pitching and getting these properties. We don't even say that. So how, so when you call, what is like, what is generally the script? That so so here, here's what I, here's what happens when I call. You, y'all ready? You about yeah. to hear the sauce? You can y'all tell. <laughs> you, know, you, got, you, know, you know you about to say. This is what happens when I call. I said, hey, my company and I are looking to rent a few properties in this in this area. We saw your uh, we saw the property. My company's are, my company and I rent ready to rent a few properties in this area. Are you the right person to talk to? Yeah yeah we ready. Okay awesome. I like sending an appointment to come look at it. That's it. That's it. Now, with an, that's with the owner control. With an apartment, I call them and I say, hey, do y'all have any more corporate leases? Mm. Because most apartment complexes allocate about 20% of their units for corporate leases. Okay. Businesses. And for businesses. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, now, and, and that's, that's going to lead me to my next point, but we want to make sure that I'm going to throw this out there. We can, we, can, we can dive into it, but we always want to make sure that we rent it under an entity, not under our personal names, mm-hmm. ever. Well, why just, is that? Okay, so we're going to get into it now. Okay. So, yeah. <laughs> Okay, so, well, for me, it's two main reasons. For one, when you're in this business, you're providing a service. Whether you like it or not, you're providing a service to other people. Because. They're staying in your unit. So what does that mean? That means you're liable for everything. Yeah, You're liable for everything. If somebody slips and falls in your unit, they decide to hold you liable, mm-hmm. and they want to sue you. Somebody breaks a glass, and they cut their finger, and they decide that they want to sue you because of it because they're in your unit. Well, guess whose name is on a lawsuit? Whatever name is on a lease agreement. Mm-hmm. So if your name is on a lease agreement, anything tied to you, it's gone, or it's going. Go, it's, going after. it's it's up. They come. Yeah, they they can come for it. It's, it's all up for grabs. Yeah. Anything tied to you that belongs to your family members, like th- you got to think, you got to think yourself. what's tied to you. Yeah. A lot, a lot is tied to you, and they can come for a lot. So you got to protect yourself from that standpoint, from liability protection. We leave it at the entity. They don't go further than the entity. That's it. So uh, uh, also, also. When you do it under a business, understand like if I if I was to rent my property out to you, you are and you decide to rent out to somebody else, and I qualified you as an individual, and you decide to rent it under to somebody else, by definition you're subleasing. Mm-hmm. Like you're, you you exactly. get a lot of trouble for that. Yeah. Like you're subleasing, so we don't sublease. We rent it under a corporate, but because what we do is it's understood we rent it under a business. That's why it's a corporate lease. It's a corporate lease. A exactly. Yeah. It's understood that the business can't stay there. Mm-hmm. Somebody has to stay on behalf of the business. Right. So that's why we make sure we do it under a business entity. Mm-hmm. And if they won't let us do it, then we move on. Okay. Yeah. That was going to be my next one. We move on. Because you know it's you know not the right fit. It's not the right fit. For, 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 for my model. business model. Exactly. It's not, right it's not a right fit for my business model. Yeah. So we move on. Another thing you want to make sure that you do, when you go look at these properties, it has to, it has to work for you logistically. Like, what is a check-in process like? How does where do they people park? Mm. How does food get delivered? Like, will they even allow you to put your automated key lock system in these doors in the front door? Like, these are things you want to make sure that are buttoned up 
You're dotting your I's and crossing your T's from a logistical perspective before you even move, before you even commit to the property. Yeah. There's a saying in the in the game of entrepreneurship: if you treat your business like a hobby, mm, it's gonna pay like a hobby. It's gonna, it's gonna cost you like a hobby. It's gonna cost you, <laughs> right? If you treat it like a hobby, it's gonna cost you like a hobby. Now, if you treat it like a business, it's gonna pay you like a business. Facts. That's Ooh. the facts about it. And, <laughs> and, and, and and renting these properties just under your name, just to get on Airbnb, which yeah. is literally what eighty percent, ninety percent of people do in this game. <laughs> They're treating it like a hobby. Yeah. Yes, sir. And it's going to cost them as such. This is such an important conversation just for business in general. Because yeah. most people, we and we talked about this before, most people are just so eager to just get into it and yeah. just to get, no, I just want to get a property or I just want to, you know, get a unit. I just want to start making money. It's like you sat, you, and the reason this is, I I think just based on the question Marlon asked too about long-term rentals versus short-term rentals. Yeah. Like, the pro- the problem with low barrier to entry things. <laughs> <laughs> You're about to say very good point. Absolutely, <laughs> yeah. that's the problem. It's a low barrier to entry. Yes, man. I mean, everybody wants to do. Everybody get in this money. And that's the and the thing is a lot of men, the many will ruin it for the few. Yes, sir. absolutely. Oftentimes, that's a fact. And so, what happened? What I what what you tend to see, especially in general with businesses like well, real estate specifically, and I think I'll consider this just for the conversation context of real estate with rental arbitrage. Right. Generally, there there's like there's three things you I, you have to have two of these three things to get into business in general, right? You either need money, you need hustle and knowledge, and you need time. Mm-hmm. Those three things. Generally, if you don't have money, you need to have the other two: hustle yep. slash knowledge and time. Yep. Because whenever you're getting into something with a low barrier to entry, it can be it, the reason it's a low barrier to entry is. Usually because of the money aspect. Mm-hmm. It's not because of the hustle, like because someone doesn't have hustle or knowledge or time. Yeah. So you have to focus on the education specifically when you're getting onto things with lower barrier entry. Facts. It's That's so fact. important. One thousand percent. I mean, and and you know, shoots. In some situations, you really need one of the three. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? And you can go find the other two. A lot of time. If you have the time, you but you don't have the money. money definitely you if you had a lot of money, you can find a time. But yeah. you got to have a hustle, though. Yeah. Man. You got to have a hustle. So definitely two out of the three. So I would say, you know, I agree with 1,000%. 1,000%. Because at the end of the day, one of, I think probably the biggest lesson I learned in 2021, I'm not going to lie, this year has been a blessing for me. Um, we grew we grew nicely. Uh, the relationships, I mean, that's the thing I'm most excited about the most this year is yeah. the relationships that I've built because we are really about to run some things up next year. Um, you know, so the – goodness, I was about to say something very important. <laughs> I lost my train of thought. But at the end of the day, at the end of the day, no, that's very, very crucial. Yeah. 100%. 100% I agree with that. Okay, now I want to just talk about this exact oh, topic. I, I, oh, no, my point. Get it, get it, get it. <laughs> I knew it was going to come back. Yeah. <laughs> I wasn't going to keep going either. Get it. <laughs> so, so that's one of the biggest things I learned this year. One of the biggest things I learned this year is that we literally can go further together. Thanks. I think one of the biggest mistakes that I was making earlier in my entrepreneurship journey is I was trying to do everything by myself. Mm. Literally everything. Yeah, okay. I was trying to do everything by myself. And, and I'm telling you, we can go further together. 100%. So a lot of times just, you know, partnering, building relationships. Yeah. If you lack in one if you lack in one aspect, man, find somebody who has it. Mm-hmm. Find somebody who has it and y'all make some y'all make run it run the play together yeah. and watch how far you go and watch what forges just from that deal. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Just from that relationship, that deal, watch what comes from that. So absolutely 100%. Love the mentality, man. I, for one, I just love the business acumen that you have with the approach to yeah. the uh, to the, the like the, the rental owners. Like so, for the apartment complexes, the approach that you have is one that mitigates fear. Yeah, I understand that fear is the number one motivator for somebody to say no. Yep. So if they if they hear you say, "Hey, I'm, I'm calling. I want. Did I do Airbnb?" <laughs> they're gonna be like. Hell no, we don't, because <laughs> your approach is making me fearful that you are yeah. going to treat this as a side hustle, yeah. and you're just looking to make some quick money off yeah. of Airbnb. Because our property. Right. So now you're going to mess us up, because yeah. the thing about what's in it for the other person, if people learn how to do that more often, then they will understand that the approach that they're taking is not the best approach to mm-hmm. get the deal done. Mm-hmm. You're you're thinking about yourself when you're saying, or you have to do Airbnb, because you're thinking about how much money can I make? I just need, I just need a property, mm-hmm. and you're just so happen to be the one that I'm going to take, take over right now mm-hmm. i don't care what happens to it 
I just need some money. Yeah. So you're looking out for your own exactly. self versus the other person. But when you yeah. look, out, look out for the other person, then they'll begin to look out for you. Man, you know what's crazy? That's probably one of the most important things that you can do when you're having these conversations. Prioritize them. Yeah. Like if they feel like you have their best interests at heart, even like the lease agreements that we use for our landlords, it's not one-sided at all. Mm. Matter of fact, it's, it's leaning on the landlord's side like, and it should. Yeah. It should because... You know, this isn't a typical situation, not a typical lease. I'm understanding that, you know, you're trusting us in our business. So, yeah, we want to make sure that every single person that comes in here is going to adhere to your landlord rules, to your to this lease agreement. They have to also adhere to this lease agreement. When you when you put them first and they can actually feel that they can see it, they can tell by the conversation that, look, they genuinely care. That matters. Mm -hmm. That goes a long way. One hundred percent. Yes, sir. And I, of course, we said earlier, the problem with this business is that a lot of people are looking at it as a side hustle, yep. just one of their side hustles. Like yep. you mentioned earlier yourself that you were in a lot of things early on. And so nobody like there's a, only a select few people like the, your, like you said, your girl who had the 200 units that she yep. sold for millions. She was focused in on that one. Industry. Oh, yeah. So she this was wasn't a side hustle for her. Most people are looking at it as a side hustle, but not an actual business that they can scale. Absolutely. So one thing I have is for those people who are actually looking to scale the business, what is the process like for scaling something mm. such as this? Because mm -hmm. now you need people in place Absolutely. that are going to be cleaning the houses, that's going to be looking over them. Absolutely. Do you meet at every single one of your properties? Like to explain that for us. Great question. So for one, you know, we talk a lot about passive income. Yeah. And what people have to realize um, is that in order for income to get passive, a lot of times you got to get active. Get active first. <laughs> in the beginning. Right? <laughs> you got to get active. So you got to be active. And this is one of those businesses where you will wear a few hats in the beginning. Okay. Um, but with teams, with systems, you'll be able to literally walk away. I mean, the same amount of time it takes me to run and manage five beds is the same amount of time it takes me to run and manage 55 plus beds. Why? Because of a team. Mm -hmm. Now, I like to kind of categorize your team in this particular business model, like with two different teams, your field team and your technology team. We love technology. That's a very important part of our team yeah. of our team because without technology, this business definitely wouldn't be as sweet automation. as automation. Oh my God. So automation is crucial. And technology plays a big role in that. Then you like then you got your field team, your cleaners, goodness gracious, your cleaners, <laughs> your cleaners, your most important team member by far. That is your most important team member. Your clean. They literally could be the backbone of your business. Yeah. My first year in this business, I ran through four cleaning crews. My first year in this business, uh, until I found that one that I work with. Now I have two crews. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, and and because you asked, I'll tell you how my org chart is right now for, in my in my business. Um, and it's not that complicated. It's me. Then it's my executive assistant. Under my executive assistant, there's two other assistants. And then, it's tech, then we just use technology all throughout there. Mm -hmm. And that's the team. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's the team. And of, then, of course, you have your cleaning team. Right. I have a, I have, you have a cleaning team. This is like all under, the, like, because the assistant's kind of just running the show. So then you have your cleaning team. Then you have maintenance. I have a maintenance guy that's on retainer. Mm -hmm. He gets the same amount of money every single month. Whether we have zero call outs that month or 30, 30 maintenance issues that month, he gets paid the exact same and he's happy. So we have maintenance guy. And then uh, your laundry service, which can be done in house by your cleaners or a third party company. Company. That's another part of your team member. So that's that's essentially that's essentially what the team looks like. And the team's important. That's what makes the business what it is. Mm -hmm. That's what makes it makes you to be able to automate it. In the beginning, you know, uh, oh, I meant to say this. For one, I some people when they start this business, they'll clean their own units. Right. I never clean my own units. <laughs> that's, um, that's one that's, thing I was gonna answer. <laughs> that's, just, that's just not where my time is spent. That's just right. not where my time is valued at. Because I think now my cleaners, that's where her time is valued at. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? But my time isn't valued in cleaning my units. Man, my first unit was a three bedroom, two bath house. You know how long it'll take me to clean right. that? To to get it up to a standard for the next guest? It's gonna take me at least four or five hours. Yeah. I, <laughs> and I charge you know what I'm saying? I charge for the cleaning fee ninety dollars for to clean it, so that's not even worth my time, not even remotely. Ninety dollars for four or five hours. Not even close. Not even close. So <laughs> not even worth my time whatsoever. Matter of fact, um, the um, the I I outsource my cleaning crew like right away in in the very beginning. Yeah. That's gonna be my and next question. Okay, yes, cool. one hundred in the very beginning. I so outsource. Like, you only got one unit. You still recommend getting out uh, outsourcing? Get out. Yeah, I had a third party cleaning company. Okay. Now this is a, and hire a third party company to begin it because that way you're not solely depending on bringing bringing them work. They already have work that they do. They clean other people's units. Yeah. They just added yours to their to their portfolio and they'll be able to come clean your units no problem. And uh, so. 
the cleaning team, man, that's that's like super crucial. So cl- cleaners go in. They clean it, uh, as soon as the cleaning starts, m- myself and my assistants, we get a notification on our phone. Hey, cleaning has started. It's the technology we use for that. Mm-hmm. As soon as the cleaning's done, we get a notification. Hey, the cleaning's done. Not only is it done, but here are pictures showing that everything is, is the way it's supposed to be all through the technology software that we use. Systems. Systems. Automation, Systems. Man. And now, I, while I was the one you know, monitoring all that, now I have an executive assistant that monitors all that yeah. and makes sure that those are the quality control, make sure everything is good. So, you know, literally... You can, and even at the beginning with one unit, there's a lot. There's there's a few things that you can outsource, even at the beginning, to save a lot of your time. Your guest communication, you can outsource that alone. That alone is going to save you like 70% of your time. Mm-hmm. Then revenue. Revenue, because at the end of the day, we don't want stagnant pricing. We want our pricing to be what we consider dynamic mm-hmm. or fluctuating pricing. Because what it does to the OTAs, when I say OTAs, I'm talking about the online travel agencies. These are the platforms, mm-hmm. Airbnb, BRBO. Let's get into football talk. <laughs> <laughs> We're not team activities. Huh? <laughs> no, no. So, so when I first time I said this, somebody said, well, OTA training camp? Yeah. That's, <laughs> that's, that's the first thing I thought. Like, you just hear, hear them buzzwords like, oh, dang, I don't, <laughs> this I have a PTSD. Like, oh, man, it's hot. <laughs> it's hot. It's hot. It's got hot of y'all of a sudden. Oh, man. See, sorry. We all play ball. Yeah, man. That's yeah. crazy. <laughs> <laughs> um, so so yeah, I mean you know the when you when you get on these platforms, you know when you get on these platforms, these OTAs they bring you they'll bring you your your business right. They'll bring mm-hmm. you that guest. But I like to let people know every guest that you get through your OTA, they need to be in your database yeah. now. Collect all information. Collect all the information. Email, phone numbers. Email, phone number. And we have systems to where not only are we collecting information of the people that book the unit. But every single person that walks Inquires. in there, no, that steps foot. Oh, so say say it's a say somebody books it for and it's six of them coming to stay. That's good. I'm man. collecting their information. The person that books it, I already got their information when they booked it. And right? their friends. But but how you get everybody that comes in there, I get their information too. How you get their information? Good question. It's a great question, actually. It's a great question. <laughs> 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 Listen, it's about, God, my life was off. It's the value going, the sauce, man, man. goodness gracious. Uh, But no, it's a great question. So what we do is, um, it was crazy. I was just putting the guy out there on this. Oh, for real? I was putting him on game. And um, we were talking about the importance of, because he was telling me how, you know, you rent these properties out. And and I was telling him about the importance of when you're in a space like this, because I'm in a similar space with short-term rentals. When you're in a space like this, you have to be collecting every single person's information. If something, if like we can't be solely dependent on just one, like every person that comes through the platform, you should have their, you should have their contact it's information. It's a lead source, man. It's a lead source. They yeah. need to go in your email database. So for us, we have three different layers in where we do this. So if somebody books with us, um, we ask them for the email and phone number. Say, so, hey, give us, please send us your email address or phone number. That way we can reach you directly because these uh, OTAs, they have the um, the little the little ghost email addresses. Like it's not it's not if you email them through the platform, it, it won't show you their real email address. It'll be like mm. Airbnb at see, yeah, random numbers and zeros yeah, and yeah. because they they're hiding their email address for privacy reasons that yeah. they're supposed to. This that's that's why we have to ask them for it mm-hmm. when when they book with us. So we mm-hmm. ask them for it when we ask about thirty five percent only of the people that book actually respond with their email and phone number. So 35%, that's it. Then the next layer is our guidebook, right? Our guidebook has, um, in order for you click our guidebook, it has information like the check-in information, Wi-Fi, recommendations, places to eat, things to do in the city. As soon as you click the guidebook, you have to put in your email address Smooth to get access with to it. it. I like that. As soon as you put it in, it goes straight to our database. Yes, sir. The biggest play. Uh-oh. That <laughs> wasn't even big, the biggest. That wasn't even it. That's, that's only layer two. And guess what? We get a lot of emails from there because the guest, the person that books it, always sends it to everybody else. Thanks. Oh, here's a guidebook. They'll send yeah. a link. It's just a link. Just send yeah. a link to all your people. We let it, we encourage them. Hey, make sure you send a link to your parties. That way they have access to everything. They have all the information as well. And the third way is what when you when you walked in here, what was one of the things that was like that you did that was just really important that you needed to do in order for this setup? Like for this setup. Like what do we need in here? Computers and but what's important for our computers, our tablets? Wi-Fi. 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 Yeah, good. Wi-Fi. Everybody gets into Wi-Fi. Mm-hmm. As soon as they walk in the building, one of the first things that they do is connect to the Wi-Fi. Sheesh. That's good. As soon right as they here. tap into the Wi-Fi, they have to log in. Got it. They have to log in. Matter of fact, if I wanted to, we have technology that we use in our business. If I wanted to, I can have two different speeds and charge for the fastest speed. 
say, hey, okay, you want this speed? That's you know another revenue. Source. That's another yeah. re- that's another revenue source. So, um, the Wi Fi. So 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 real quick then. Obviously, so with that, they have to they will have to like uh, in order to use the Wi Fi, they have to agree to receive email they, marketing from they, you. exactly. They have to put they have to put uh, the first name, last name, email address, mm-hmm. and then they agree. Exactly. They have to agree. Yeah. yeah. There. Which they don't read it anyway. But no, they don't. Yeah. <laughs> Not even a little bit. <laughs> but now in the future, so this is so critical. But Go. what's crazy, and I'm gonna, please don't forget what you about. Okay, what you. I was about to say is, literally, I haven't had not one person like, like just ever complain to me about yeah. sending them emails. Like right. it hasn't even happened. Yeah, it hasn't even happened. And so as soon as they get into our email address, now they get dripped. They get nine nine drip messages every once a month. So for nine months. They're gonna get dripped. Oh wow! Right, the first message. The first message goes out. The first email they get. Thank you so much for booking with us. We love that you stay with us. Thank you. I'm glad you had a five star stay. Next time, book direct with us. Here's our direct email address. Here's fifteen percent off your next stay. Book direct with us and save on the fees, and save on booking fees because the guests pay fourteen percent to book on Airbnb. Actually, I think it's thirteen. They pay it to book on Airbnb. Hey, wow. book direct with us, save on the fees, and here's 15% off your next day with yeah. us. Con- now, now all this is systematized. I don't do nothing, yeah. but I did a lot on the front end to, get it to set there. it up. Mm-hmm. But now it's systematized, and literally we're building this email database in this in an automated fashion. And we're building our own email list because at the end of the day, we want to go direct. Our goal as we get into, the, uh, get it, especially get into 2022, we want a certain percent, like I want at least by the end of the year, I want like half of my res- bookings that come to be direct bookings. Direct from, mm-hmm. direct from me. Now you're building a business. Yeah. Now you're building a brand. And that's yeah. what it's about. Ooh, there was. <laughs> my live was off the whole time. Yeah. <laughs> the, the reason, the reason. And this though, is the sauce, man. The reason though this is so, so crazy because it's like from, from literally everything that you're doing, like literally from the tech stack that you use because mm-hmm. i don't think a lot of people don't realize how important the tech stack oh, the is tech stack's like, crucial yeah it, it, with, with automation and like technology especially to, in this day and age it's like that becomes a part of your like the way you make technology talk to each other mm-hmm. and interact with each other without mm-hmm. you having to do it using zapier integrations and all these yep. other things that you know can go into the business that is what creates value for your business that's what creates equity in the business because at the end of the day Whenever you're building a business, you should be building it with the intent of who would buy this business down the line. Absolutely. And the person that's going to buy this business doesn't want to be sitting here collecting emails. The person that's going to buy this business doesn't want to be sitting here calling cleaners. The person that's going to buy this business doesn't want to be in the day-to-day of this business. They want this business to work as if no, you were still running it. Absolutely. They just own it now. Absolutely. And that's what, that's, that's, what, that's what you're doing. You're designing a business that it's going to be attractive. To the end buyer, ultimately absolutely. At some point down, the absolutely, one hundred percent. And say, like you said, that end buyer, if they want to buy it now. Hey, here's a profitable business bringing in this much a month. Right. Mm-hmm. Everything is set up. Everything is in place. The team's in place. The systems are in place. Here. Yeah. It's a business in a box. And it's now. a business in a box. Yes, now, and, at that and, point, and that's how people need to be designing their business from day one. It's your number one customer should be whoever is going to be the empire of the absolutely business. that should be your, not 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 i mean your customers are important but like your and number one customer of all time should be who, whoever is going to buy that business because at the end of the day if that if you're always doing things with them in mind you're going to create the most valuable business that you possibly 1, can because i think it's easy to just think it's because we're doing it it's like oh, i can i don't mind doing this yep. but no i, I know Somebody the owner that bought, that's going to buy he's going to mind doing this <laughs> Or that person's gonna mind doing this, so I need to design this in a way to where they won't care about, uh, or they won't have to do this. So yeah, I love what you're doing, building a brand, man. That is so real, cause like at the end of the day, you can't rely on Airbnb, you can't rely on VRBO, nah. you can't even rely on Google, Danny. Nah, <laughs> like you need to. The only thing I want to rely on is the Wi-Fi and the internet that's gonna be sending this information, and even then, <laughs> blockchain. I might need to go decentralized. You know, so many different things that yeah, you know, we yeah. could try to take the middleman out of. But yeah. I love what you're doing. Man, man I appreciate it. I'm just looking at your whole entire story, man, just because we ain't really even give it is just due. Yeah. Because just going back to the very beginning, you were just were ha- you've been driven for a long, very long time yeah, in your life. I have. Always coming from behind, essentially. Like I think it reflects in a lot of different areas of your life. Like just looking at your physique for for instance, that's a, a byproduct of you being driven to like tr- prove people wrong, especially how they talked about you before. And it's just every area, like w- whether it's getting into school, 
whether it was figuring out a way to like the degree that you end up getting, the job you end up getting was a production of just the work ethic. Yeah, and so it just sure. makes perfect sense that when you transfer transfer that same mentality, that same energy to a different field, it's gonna you're gonna kill it in that field as well. Absolutely, because of the fact that this is just you. Yeah. That's what we talk about a lot with both of us is that it is whatever you put us into, mm-hmm. we're going to do good at it because we are driven to be, to be the best Absolutely. at it or at least excel in that particular field. It doesn't matter the field. That's it doesn't matter fact. what it is. If you put me into a place where I need to go get into a school, I'm about to find a way. Yeah. You put me into a place I need to do good as an engineer, I'm going to do I'm gonna excel in that. You yep. said you were a lead engineer by yep. the time you left. Yep. Same thing with in, the, in the rental industry now. I'm going to kill it in that space. Absolutely. Because this is just who I am. So I just want to just give you that, t- just to give you a props for that, man. Because sure that, man. I just because you just I, see I, that it, it, it happens in every single aspect of your life, appreciate and that's what, that. and just that mentality, you just, having that is kind of a gift in a way. So yeah, I just that is a gift, man. Yeah. Yeah. So we appreciate you for <laughs> showing up today. And first, no how can people tap into the, yeah. uh, everything that it is? TJ? Yeah. like just telling people like how, how can we find out more about you? Oh man, and um, just about like. Um, how can they tap into like your resources to learn yeah, more? Yeah, absolutely. So I mean, definitely tap in with me on social media for sure. Uh, Instagram heavy um, at TJ to Johnny um, at TJ to Johnny. It's just my name. I'm my own brand, uh, and I apologize to my folks on live. We my battery had died. I feel bad for y'all, <laughs> but, man. <laughs> yeah, they miss a lot. They miss a lot, uh, but it's all good. Uh, but uh, but no, no, we'll definitely make sure that we we, we blast this episode when it comes out. So I'm yeah. excited for this episode to come out. But yeah, tap on me on Instagram. Uh, follow me on Clubhouse as well. You might catch me there running my mouth on something. Uh, and uh, and yeah, and for folks who you know, if you're interested in talking about any type of coaching, mentoring, just shoot me a shoot me a DM and I'll send you a link, and we'll book a call. Let's talk about it. Let's yeah. talk about it for sure. We gave you the game. You can take it or leave it. Man, that was an absolutely amazing episode. I think there were so many different, man, things that people could take out of that. <laughs> bro was really speaking facts, bro. Like that, I think that episode, a lot of the things he talked about, like it was applicable to um, short term rentals, but a lot of those things are also applicable for just business in general. Facts. Like, there was so many things just talking about the systems obviously building a brand building a business as opposed to just relying on one entity like airbnb that principle is applicable in every business Mm -hmm. right like for your business obviously that's something that's that's important for you like you can't just rely on toro to get rentals right if someone has you know any type of online presence in which you gain business based off of um somewhere like there's a middleman pretty Mm -hmm. much you can't rely on a middleman that's the essence of what we're talking about like (laughs) almost to the point like i said in the episode almost to the point where it's like the only middleman i want to rely on is the (laughs) wi-fi like that's the only middleman and even then like yo i might i gotta get decentralized at some (laughs) point or something but i mean that's through the wi-fi too but same thing like i for my business like i don't want my only source of customers to be from google mm-hmm. like I, I need customers from google i need customers from yelp i need customers from uh you know referrals i need customers from email marketing i need customers from everywhere right just because that is how you build a business that can stand and the the test of time yeah because there will be things that will happen that will like you said that could be a single point of failure and that's an engineering term where it's like you're an engineer yeah yeah you're especially because he was in oil and gas so it's like obviously working with valves and all those things like trying to troubleshoot back to like where could this fare have come from or like where could where could the system fail where is the most vulnerable point of the system Mm -hmm. and for a lot of businesses (laughs) if you only have one channel for revenue that is going to be your most vulnerable point a failure Fair. that is where your business can fail so it's important to have an email list it's important to have seo it's important to have paid marketing it's important to have social media right mm-hmm. but we can't rely on any one of these it's important to have them all so that if one goes down we still have the others because mm-hmm. remember at the end of the day if you don't own the platform and that's where your customers come from you don't have your customers you don't own your customers so it's so important that was just one of 50 million things <laughs> that i think he said during that episode that was just so dope what did you think of it Love this podcast episode all together because I think he was very, very good at just showing how the general business um, principles can be applied. And like the what, what he talked about for short term rentals can be applied to any business like you were just to your point. Yeah. And I think it's very important to understand like a lot of people are try, trying to pursue multiple streams of income. You need to pursue multiple sh- streams of lead generation. 
Mm. Make sure that you always have leads coming in from somewhere. Like you always have a way to acquire more leads, a, a way to continue to let your business run. Because just think about this, for instance, like there was a, like a month or two ago, I forgot how long ago it was, but Facebook and Instagram, it went down for a while. Like, a, like, a, like I said, it's a couple months ago now. But when that happened, a lot of people's businesses also went down yeah. because they rely solely on those platforms for their business. And so you need to be able to have a way to access your customers, whether they are on this platform or um, whether they're whether that platform is shut down because you have no control over that platform. And once and you, that means you're you're at the mercy, your business, your livelihood is at the mercy of somebody else that you can't control. Mm-hmm. And so that's why it's so important about to uh, preach ownership in whatever business that you're going into. Like you need to be, be able to, you need to own whatever it is. That way, when you sell it off to somebody else in the future, they know that they can they're buying a business that is gonna it's not relying on somebody else's business somebody else's business for your business to run. Yeah. That's what makes your business more valuable. So that's yeah. what I took away from this one. And that's so real. I hate just in my and that's how I operate my business. Like I want to make sure that like it's I if if the business is gonna fail, it's because it's something that I did. It's not because something I, another company did that I had no say over. Mm-hmm. Like any company, Yelp, Google, whatever, Toro, Airbnb, they can make a decision, and obviously they're not gonna consult you <laughs> about their exactly. decision. And however whatever the outcome of that decision is, is going to be the outcome. You're going to have to pivot based on that. So I don't want to put the hands of my business and my livelihood in a, a company that could be making decisions based off of a lot of times shareholders, you know, uh, best interests, right? Like mm-hmm. it, a lot of these companies, people rely on Facebook, Google, Airbnb, Toro, all these companies, they're all public companies and they have shareholders. And at the end of the day, they're going to do what's in the best interest of their shareholders. Yep, because that is now their job. Like the they, you have to report to your boss. You have to report to the owner. And now the owners of these companies are public shareholders. So now they're gonna make decisions that they're not. They're, they're you're no longer, you're no longer going to be their number one priority. Um, as the, you know, uh, consumer or user of this business. So, yep. so important to people for people to understand that and apply that to whatever business. This is regardless of whatever business you're in. If you have an online business, I would say. Especially if you have an online business. If you have if you're just doing real estate and you know, that's all you do then it's not really as applicable if you're doing strictly long term rentals and flipping houses and stuff like that. It's still applicable to a sense, but not as much as if you have an online business that relies on a middleman. So that's what I would say. Cut the middleman out and uh build your own business, make your own business valuable by building your tech stack, building your SOPs, getting your automation right building your uh, multiple sources of cha- channels of uh, lead generation, all those different things, build all that out so that you will have a very robust business that can withstand anything. And that's, I think, the biggest takeaway that people need to get out of here. So like you say, or like I'm going to start saying, take it or leave it. Fact. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, that is it for this episode of the Money Monopolizers podcast. New episodes will be released Every Thursday, we'll be available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and YouTube. Just search Money Monopolizers wherever you listen to podcasts. We hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, we'd appreciate it if you rated us five stars and left us a review on Apple Podcasts. You can also find out more info about us on Twitter at The Monopolizer or IG at Money Monopolizers. We post informative content on there that keep you engaged. So be sure to check that out and share those posts. But until then, we are out of here. You've been listening to The Money Monopolizers Podcast. Helping you take control of your financial destiny. To learn more about how you can be in control of your money, visit MoneyMonopolizers.com. We'll catch you next time when Alex and Marlon share more personal finance and wealth creation tips. Now it's time to take action.